Can you feel it? 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 Can you feel? Can you feel it? 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 Can you feel? Can you feel? Hello, friends. Welcome to Forza the podcast that dives in to explore the nature and experience of being alive. I'm your host, Tracy Brinock, performance artist, writer, researcher, mother, lover, all round deep diver into embodied experience. What does it feel like to be alive? How can I describe it and communicate it? How can we learn from each other's experiences of aliveness? In the series, I talk with a wide variety of guests, artists, activists, educators, spiritual teachers, writers, guides, shamans, to find out more about their experiences of the force, life force, energy of life, elixir of life, source, whatever we might call it. I hope it brings something new to your experience of being alive. I'm delighted to welcome my guest Carly Mountain to this episode. Carly's work uh, is focused around facilitating women to become more intimate with their body, sexuality, voice, creativity, and an instinctive knowing rooted in the earth. She wants to support women to change narratives from the inside out. The main threads of her work include embodiment, integrative psychotherapy, psychosexual somatic therapy, poetry, medicine, breath work, intimacy, and leadership. In 2014, the Butterfly Mystery School was birthed and has become a home for women who she describes are foraging for another way. She also creates sacred spaces for women's community and bespoke one-to-ones online and in person. She's based in Sheffield in the UK. So Carly, thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm very excited because actually we don't know each other that well. We've had a couple of conversations um, and been introduced through Jules primarily, who I've also had on the podcast. And also I know I've done a little bit of work with Kim Rosen and she's been one of your main teachers for breathwork and poetry and what you've been doing. Um, So I wonder if we start there of, of those sorts of connections between our work uh, and how that, um, how you relate that to this theme of life force or aliveness? What is it about those transformational practices that appeal to you? And how does it bring you more alive? And then also the people that you offer it out to in the world? Mm, mm, thank you. And yeah, thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, it's good to connect with you in this way. Um, Perhaps I start with a poem um, because that's actually what led me to Kim and to Jules inadvertently. Um, And so, yeah, that seems like a good place to start. So this poem is called The Cure. Um, We think we get over things. We don't get over things. Or say we get over the measles, but not a broken heart. We need to make that distinction. The things that become part of our experience never become less a part of our experience. How can I say it? The way to get over a life is to die. Short of that, we move with it. Let the pain be pain. Not in the hope that it will vanish but with the faith that it will fit in. Find its place in the shape of things and then not be any less pain, but true to form. Because everything natural has an inherent form and will flow towards it. That's what we're looking for. Not the end of a thing, but the shape of it. 
Wisdom is seeing the shape of your life without obliterating or getting over a single instant of it. Mm. That's one of my most loved poems by uh, Albert Hofstickler. And um, I think held encapsulated in that is, is so much of, of this conversation of life force. And very much, I feel like that poem very much holds the essence of what inspires me about um, both Kim and Jules's work and my own work um, in the sense of, I feel like what my job is, is to hold both the part of our humanness that has perhaps had to accommodate, shape, twist towards life, to survive life and the, the difficulties we encounter and also hold that paradox of the part of our inherent life force that's untouched, that remains constant, that, that indestructible life force inside of us, call it source, call it God, whatever your particular name is. And I feel like what I've really been learning um, in life and with Kim as a key guide for the last seven, eight years is how do we hold those paradoxes together and work in the gap between them? Um, and so I feel like that's what I'm doing when I work with people, either as a therapist or a sacred space holder, whatever it is I'm doing or sitting, you know, together in this conversation is how do I hold both my humanness and my personal story with what is also part of me and beyond me in that and and what is the gap and how do they relate and how am I guided by that rather than I think what we can often tend to want to do is exile the human part on some level particularly the difficult or wounded part and um, I feel like what I have grown more and more courage to do as I've got older and continue to try and grow more courage to do is is welcome all of myself, all the parts of myself um, as a, a part of my life force, as a part of the life force, mm -hmm. um, which sometimes as humans we don't do. I feel like flowers do it completely freely and, mm -hmm. you know, many animals, you know, they're just being, aren't they? But mm -hmm. as humans complicate matters considerably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm thinking of the the word of expression of life force, how mm -hmm. each of us uniquely, individually has a unique expression of life force. And that includes all of the parts of ourselves, that it's everything that we are or all of our past is here in us. All of our future yet yet to be birthed is here in us. All of that personality is here. And I'm curious how in some spiritual traditions there uh, I feel there is um, like a, a will to like you said it's a disregarding the wounding or it's sort of leaving it behind but for me that manifests in the body that we want to leave the body behind we want to come out into an expanded spiritual state and the body is a real bane of our spiritual life because it's so dense and it takes so long to change. And, you know, I feel all of this amazing spiritual light and all oh, my right knee is just in pain all the time. And I hear that in the poem that you've just shared, you know, in the, the pain of the body, the physical body of how if we come to the experience of it and allow the pain to be the pain without needing to change it or disregard it or cut it out then it will just be the pain and then it might be something else or whatever but well, just allowing yeah yeah which is so contrary to many of our cultural and dominant spiritual messages certainly in the west isn't it it's that mm. very split sort of spiritual here body there um, and I think when I discovered Tantra at age 22, I was so enlivened by it because it was the place where the sexual and the spiritual 
came together. Mm. And when we're speaking about the body, obviously, sexuality is a huge part of our body experience, sensuality being a sensual being. And um, so, yeah, I'm very passionate about a form of spirituality that will include the body, mm. that includes our embodied experience, that includes and, and within that, the pain, as you've just said, all the way through to the pleasure of the body um, and, you know, and everything in that spectrum in between, really. Mm. Um, Do, can you talk a little bit more? I was thinking of a question, which is, you know, was there a particular moment in your life where this, the two paths that you described of your, your spiritual nature or your being and, and then the, the human beingness in there. Um, was there a time in your life where, where you just became aware of all of that within yourself? And, and maybe it is this moment when you're 22 and you discover Tantra. How did you find that? How did you come to that? What did it change for you or open up for you? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think I was angry, really angry with God <laughs> um, and did not consider myself. I think I had banded in spirituality with God as the institution of religion. And I rejected that for a long, long time, even as a yoga teacher, even when I discovered Tantra, I think I still had a massive rejection of um, myself as a, the vision of myself as a spiritual person didn't really I don't think I'd welcomed that in it, it was much later that that I actually realized how angry with God I was actually after I had my children even but I do think that I was an inherent inherently spiritual being always but the anger with with religion and the oppression and the exclusion of sex and that patriarchal nature of that I felt a very strong pushback against that from being very young um, and yeah I really I remember going to a teacher one day it wasn't a teacher I was with for very long and they sent me a questionnaire before I went to a session with them and one of the questions was what is your relationship with God and I just blurt wrote this angry tirade and I thought what is that? <laughs> and I read it out to my husband and what, I just went, I'm so angry. I didn't know that I was so angry about this. And it was just a real wake up call. And actually it was the beginning of that dissolving and um, me reclaiming my right to a spirituality that was not that did not have to be held within the stone walls of a, a church mm. essentially a spirituality that could be held in my body mm. so tantra awoke me i guess to the experience of spiritual experience i was experiencing an embodied spirituality but i didn't call it that till much later i don't think mm. um, that's a good question i've not really considered mm. that, that it, it resonates for me, I guess, because my my work, you know, I did a lot of research around birth and birth stories. And I was looking particularly, you know, sort of going back to classical Greece and this split between mind and matter, spirit and matter and spirit being elevated and associated with a male and the body was sort of denigrated and associated with the, with a female. And really that continued until the 19th century when we actually worked out you know how conception happened so there was this sort of idea that the man is bringing the spirit the god to the the life force to create the child but the woman is really and they thought through the menstrual blood forming the physical body oh. and so this uh, association between the genders and the and the and its value is being devalued one is more important than the other you know has been around for thousands of years okay. um, in in the culture um and so i am curious also then you know with that whole mind body split of how we are i feel more and more living in a time where the body is being reclaimed um not just by women but um but men too um and 
and a, a sort of a we're turning towards the body into the body mindfulness practices I think take us towards that but I don't think they necessarily bring us into the body and and then I'm really curious as to what happens when we are in our bodies you know when I have that spiritual experience when so what I would say I experience my own spirit my own being in my body through my body you know and that's when I experience ecstasy that's when I experience bliss that's it when I experience oneness and that's not outside of my body it's through my body it's sensate for me um and it's not uh, fleeting it's not something I have to I can only have on special times you know it becomes available to me all the time and that seems to again really subvert this idea of I need to go off to the mountain or I need to go off to the ashram or I need to go somewhere special to have this spiritual experience. Actually, this is available to me all the time. Yeah. If I can just come here and be here, which means taking away some of that conditioning that's telling me I need to be doing or, you know, over there, or I need to be thinking, I need to be working out. But actually right now, as I settle in where I'm sitting, I can... I can feel that. I can feel my heart open towards you. I can feel the tingling in my hands um, as I even describe this. So a sense of being in my own body, but also connected to you mm-hmm. and 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 everything. It's here. It's available to us. Mm. Mm. And I think that idea can be really threatening to us. Like if everything's available right here, I can be anything potentially and that means I've got a lot of responsibility all of a sudden and so I feel like what we sometimes get caught in is is this entanglement um, that stops us feeling that but I think there's very good reasons why we land inside of that you know trauma Mm -hmm. past experience the way that we only want the good feelings and not the bad feelings. Whereas, of course, if I do really enter my body and enter the connection with you, I also enter into the possibility of the vulnerable vulnerability that goes with that territory. Mm. Because if I am in my body, I'm not immune to my experience anymore. Mm. Um, and I think that's the thing with the, the kind of spirituality that is spirit over there, body over here, is that we're always aspiring to that perfection and that elevation and that that aboveness, that split. There's also a safety inside of it because then it's less threatening. If I'm, if it's over there and I'm over here, there's a there's some kind of protection mechanism in that. I think. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we come into the body, yeah, we are vulnerable and we're not immune. Um, and I think some of our spiritual practices, you know, we pray in order to get the things we want often, mm-hmm. whereas perhaps a true prayer looks like, please give me the courage to be with what unfolds, mm-hmm. whatever that is, which is for me, I can feel it now as I say it, you know, that's tough mm-hmm. at times to walk with what comes. Mm-hmm. Um, But I think that this is really relevant to today because yes, people are turning back towards the body and we are turning towards our shadow, our collective shadows, I think with what's been coming up uh, in terms of Black Lives Matter movement and Me Too movement, you know, lots of things are being voiced that have been in the collective for a long time that have not been as prominently in the forefront or as widely spoken about as they're being at the moment and obviously in lockdown I think people have come much closer to their own shadows because we've been literally stopped in our tracks <laughs> um, and the, the 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 collective drive of our culture is so much around productivity numbers keeping going you know that kind of beingness that I think when people have been in their homes and really had time to land in the home and in the body, all of the things that haven't been felt are really being felt. And it's not always comfortable, is it? No, I I would say it's really intense. (laughs) And that's why we probably (laughs) like to continue to avoid it. And when you can't escape it, then 
it can feel really terrifying. Um, I guess what I notice in my own experience is that the resistance to feel it is actually more uncomfortable than the feeling it itself. <laughs> so if I have an emotion like, um, I don't know, grief, or if I have some sadness or w whatever the emotion is in my body. So there's a physical sensation that goes with the emotion. And if I start to feel, experience that physical sensation, I might feel, oh, that's a bit overwhelming. It triggers very early patterns in my childhood where I thought that was really terrifying and nervous system is completely activated and I cut out. So I've learned in my conditioning to avoid that feeling because, you know, it feels like I'm going to die. As an adult, I know I'm not going to die if I just, you know, feel this feeling. I know that. But actually, I'm in this pattern then of resisting. And the resisting, in my own experience, is the thing that causes the suffering. I suffer when I resist because my whole body is then tense more and more. Um, sort of locks, I would say, come in my diaphragm, my chest, my throat, my jaw, my forehead, even, you know, this resistance that comes in my body when I really look at that and think well what am I resisting mm. and how can I move even towards the resistance itself yeah mm. and I think you know in terms of trauma healing it's been a big theme of my work for the last um, nearly 15 years uh, actually the first step is to find somebody or a space where I feel safe enough to just be with myself mm. you mm. know and and so being able to find those people around us because it, you know, when we're in the trauma, we're merged with it. We feel like it's real, even though we might be in a room and nothing is happening internally. It doesn't feel like that. Yeah. So having somebody to, to kind of support and hold that space for us allows us to process it. And, and then and then that's, you know, that begins to integrate or resolve. I wonder if you talk a little bit about your work um it's, you've moved, you've been practicing and teaching yoga for over 20 years, and now you're moving more sp specifically into your work as a sex and relationship therapist. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you, you want to reflect on that journey and and what it, what it is about this new um, way of working that that really fulfills you. You know, what is it about that work that that drives you, I suppose? Mm. Well, I can kind of pick up the thread of what you've just been saying in the sense of you named going to find a, a space or a supportive presence that would be a container or, or a support for us to drop into that discomfort. And I guess what I'm really um, enlivened by is how our relationships become crucibles for change in that way, in that... Um, well, it doesn't have to be someone you're in a sexual relationship with. I think all our relationships will bring up our stuff. But let's say in terms of my marriage, for example, I've really found that within that, we have bumped into edges within the marriage. We've called those edges up inside of each other and we bump into them together. And I guess the real challenge in those moments are how can we notice what's going on and actually find a way to communicate in order to move with it and move through it? As it says in the Cure poem, how are we together finding this onward flow mm. inside of the relationship? Um, and so I guess I'm really enlivened by this work because I do feel that relationships are there in a sense to help till the soil of our beingness and bring up those hidden earthworms and things that we that they call us into our evolving self and they help us to evolve um, but often because it is painful and it is challenging we might leave relationships relationships will fail there will be rupture it is difficult and um Sometimes it's right that relationships don't go on. I accept that. I'm not saying that's not true, but I am really interested in, in what, what is being called up inside those relational patterns. Why is it that we are replaying old patterns from our childhood, old trauma patterns, and how can we look towards the relationships in our lives as our teachers? And I think particularly then when you go down to sex, which is 
still such a taboo in our culture. You know, people, I think in the therapy room, people often won't bring sexual issues unless invited. And even when they're invited, often there's hesitation there because it's one of those things that sex happens over there in our culture. You know, we kind of live in this hypersexualized culture that tells us exactly what sex should be, what it should look like, what it should sound like, how it should happen. And then on the other side, there's all this stuff that still just is not talked about at all, uh, not acknowledged, not felt. And so I think we get caught again, it's another split where we get caught between what the vision of the ideal experience might look like, what we might perceive it to look like and what our experience really is. And um, so I love holding a space for people to explore again, what's in that gap between what we think we should be experiencing, what we hope to experience, what we're longing for and what we are experiencing and, and how do the two things relate? How, yeah, what, what's, what's waiting to be seen or felt or heard? Mm. Um, and I think a particular sexual blueprint is so unique, as unique as our fingerprints, you know? What do you mean by sexual blueprint? Well, like the particular things that spark your sexual desire, those particular things that bring you pleasure. I mean, it can be, it's so nuanced and it can be so changeable. And I don't think our cultural model of sexuality, I still don't think it allows or acknowledges that. It's very narrow. What we, what we perceive as sex is so narrow. And actually, you know, the things that lift my libido can be, a glance or when my husband offers to do something really nice for me in the day that really supports me that supports our sexual relationship as much as anything that might happen in an actual sexual encounter you know I love it Esther Perel says something along the lines of foreplay begins immediately after the last time that you had sex it's like mm. every interaction in between counts <laughs> Mm. and um so yeah I really wish that well I hope to facilitate people coming closer and closer to that unique blueprint trusting it because it often includes our shadow mm. and our desire is often needs us to pull our shadow closer to really get to the juice of it mm. and that is challenging territory mm. So you mentioned the word libido and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm like in my body going, okay, how does that feel? Do I know the feeling of that? What's the experience? We hear phrases like um, your libido rises and falls, it comes and goes or this, this thing. So could you give a kind of a description of, of what it might, what, what's the experience of it to know that that spark is there what does it feel like in your body or mm -hmm. drawing on your own experience or clients you know what your sense of that is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well again I think it can really vary from person to person and moment to moment but what I would like to say about libido is again we tend to have this perception of it you said rise and fall mm -hmm. so we tend to have this quite linear perception Mm. of libido and sex drive where it's like it goes up it's there there'll be an orgasm and then that's the end of it right and I think this is this narrative is part of our problem because actually our so let's move away from the word libido perhaps and move back towards life force energy mm. our life force energy which can include the sexual <laughs> can rise and fall through a day for all sorts of different reasons. You know, mm -hmm. something sparks our creativity. I went to see a friend's film that she'd created the other night and I came home and I'd been so tired that day. I came home full of energy, full of it. No idea where it came from. It was that creative spark. Um, and so I feel like when we think about sexual energy, we've kind of got stuck societally in this idea of it going, up it's there it has a release and then it goes for me 
my sexual energy is with me all the time, flowing in my life. And um, what I feel, what I encourage clients to work with and what I work with myself is this idea that even within a sexual encounter, the libido, if you like, the, the energy may move more like this with highs and lows. So I'm waving my hand along because you won't be able to see, but it can move up and down. So say within one sexual encounter, my energy might move into being really sexual. Then it might go off that peak and move into a more sensual energy again. And then it might rise to a more sexual drive again. And that might end in orgasm. It might not. But how would it be to allow that energy to flow in a different way rather than being goal orientated? Mm. Um, so for me, riding the wave of my of the sexual energy fluctuates. Mm. And I don't know that we really have that as a general narrative in society. It's a much more it's much less linear, isn't it? It's mm. much less formulaic. Um, but for me, I can feel it now as I'm talking about it. There's a warmth there. There's this sense of aliveness. There's a, a tactileness and a desire to connect, be that with myself, if it's self-pleasure, or with the other, if mm -hmm. it's with another person or per people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that desire to connect with something, with, with that flow, with that energy. And I think that's why sex is so beautiful because it is such a tangible expression of our life force energy. Mm. And also can be an amazing <laughs> conduit for us feeling where our life force energy is stuck mm. or, or not able to flow, to feel the freeze mm. at times can be quite pronounced, I think. Yeah, I, I'm reflecting back on my, my own experiences and it, there's something about sexual energy that transforms uh, how I'm feeling about my body or what kind of mood I'm in. Mm. Like, you know, half an hour ago, I'm feeling sluggish and got a bit of a cold or a hangover or whatever it might be. And then all of a sudden, once that rises, um, it, tra it transforms it. I'm no longer aware of those what what while ago was sort of so pronounced in my experience it becomes really um, small in my awareness. It's no longer very important. So there's something really transformative for me about sexual energy that, like uh, I'm like the juiciness, the pulsing of it that just can just push th through other things that are stuck in my body in energetically speaking or in my mood or in my emotions mm. that, and and that's not necessarily even to do with orgasm itself um although that is a wondrous kind of <laughs> waterfall of cleansing um and also i just think for me in terms of how the energy moves around my body you mm. know it allows my entire body to be bathed in uh, a very regenerative kind of energy so um i know with um uh um in in some traditions uh so in i i don't know which book it was is it mantak chia the multi-orgasmic couple yeah so in that book i remember reading or hearing that um the importance to cycle the sexual energy so through the orgasm of of then allowing that to come right up the spine through the head you know down through the body and so cycling the energy around the body allows it to be well for us to have the full benefit if you like of mm -hmm. of the of what that is um, and so I do that a lot and I, I find uh, in my physical body it really um, like I have a, an experience of a kind of unifiedness in my entire abdomen and I'll go down to my legs as well so it, it, it brings me all together if mm. you like you know so there's a kind of breaking open and release but actually also that energy once I sort of cycle it around my body also really brings me together mm, beautiful yeah 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 mm. and it's and I think in that way it's a really empowering and full experience of our aliveness which of course when there's trauma stuck in the body 
it's, it's really not easy to find that in ourselves, is it? And so I think, I mean, I worked for a long time um, doing yoga-based practices at what was then Sheffield Women's Counseling Service, which specifically I worked with women who had experienced sexual abuse and trauma, often from childhood. And um, really witnessing how what I was really there to facilitate was, was allowing women to come back into contact with their body mm. because the body had become not a safe space. Mm. And so, um, and it was actually amazing because the feedback I got from some of the women was, wow, this has been equally as helpful, if not more helpful than my therapy. And I think the reason for that was exactly what you're saying. Like when you experience your body in the real time, in the moment, feeling that energy on whatever level. I mean, they weren't having full body orgasms, obviously, mm -hmm. but they were feeling and accessing their body again. Mm -hmm. And it was profound. Um, because I think that, unfortunately, that's one of the really huge losses about sexual trauma is that it really disenfranchises us from the ability or the trust to feel the body in that way which is um huge mm. i uh recently watched that film that gabor mate has just released the wisdom of trauma i don't know if you've seen it mm -hmm. and uh, they had a fantastic series of talks through the week and the final one was with the formerly known as Eve Ensler. Oh, and, uh, you know, she, you know, all of her work really has been ab about this, not just reclaiming her own body, but also for thousands, millions of women across the world. Um, and I feel so alive when I hear her speaking. There's yeah. something so uh, congruent for me in terms of her, her voice, her words, the emotion, it's, you know, it's all there in, in how she really comes, I suppose her experience comes through her own body. And I feel it like when somebody is able to access that power in their body with whatever the emotion is, I'm, I'm thinking going back to your letter to God, if it's the anger, if it's the rage of actually this is my body and I can I can feel this feeling. Yeah. Whoever told me I wasn't allowed to, because especially for I know for us growing up, we you know told not to shout, not to be too loud, that sort of thing. But actually, if I can really reclaim that in my body, then again, it just it bring, it's not even it brings me alive. It just moves things. It metabolizes anything that's stuck. It can just lift it out. And again, how to do that in a way that feels safe and uh, in a way that is contained enough that the nervous system isn't completely overwhelmed by the charge you know mm -hmm. that we have here um mm -hmm. so i love her work uh, i i um yeah and again you know she is a, is is a survivor of abuse yeah. and she has yeah, been exactly. able to reclaim that fullness as you're saying mm -hmm. and is so passionate and such a embodied teacher of mm. exactly this isn't she a hugely mm. inspiring woman for sure mm. um, and shows that it is really possible that's what I loved about the wisdom of trauma film is looking at how it is possible to re-embody how it is possible to unfreeze what's frozen mm. but as you're saying it needs titrating it needs mm. time it needs a, a held space usually to really contact those edges that have had to be exiled in order to survive, right? It's yeah. a great survival mechanism. Absolutely. It's necessary. We need, we need that so it's not to be ashamed of. Um, and yet often it does come with such shame. Mm. And I think all of this, like shame is so tied up with the reason that we can't fully embrace our own sexual blueprint because of those messages that we've internalized um, either from society or from our family mm. or wherever they came from um, that stop us from being fully alive, mm. not only in our sexuality, but in all parts of our lives. I think sex is so, our eros, our erotic energy is part of our life energy. 
the erotic er energy is is our life force. Sex is not something that's over there and we are over here or every other part of our life is over here and sex is over there. And I love to see more and more people embracing their sexuality as a part of everything that mm. they are. Um, mm. Yeah, because it's part of our passion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. I feel we're sort of just kind of coming towards the end and I just wondered if if you wanted to share anything about any any practices you engage with your yourself I mean I know you talked about poetry and yoga but what do you do to stay connected to stay or come back to that flow or you mm. know what, what works for you mm. so as you say I think support is essential so um, I have a great supervisor. I have Kim, who's a fantastic teacher. Um, my husband is a huge support in my life. Nature is a huge support to me. Um, I walk the dog twice a day, every day in the woods, and that is absolute medicine for me. Um, the breath work is something we haven't talked about, and it's one of the most treasured parts of my work, because one of the things we do with the parts of us that are traumatized or shut down is obviously we hold the breath mm. and it can be such that the patterns of our breathing you know we we have an experience when we're younger and we couldn't speak and we couldn't shout out which was absolutely right it, we wouldn't have survived it if we did so we then we hold the breath mm. and you know 20 years later we might still be holding on to that breath in some form in our lives mm. So the breath work for me has been one of the places where I feel I really remembered, re-embodied some of the places I was holding my breath for a very long time. And it's been amazingly transformational in my life um, and, and for others who I've held breath work for. It's one of the most beautiful practices and, and the way that I hold breath work um, is as was taught to me by Kim Rosen. So it's a really free breath. It's just a great big inhale and through the mouth and an exhale falling out. And so it's not as prescribed as some breath work practices. It's a very free breath. And as a result, it really does allow the whole body to be just bathed in breath and can be a huge, hugely releasing transformative thing. So breath work is a, is a really big one for me poetry, moving, eating good food, <laughs> friends, you know, I think, yeah, and, and time for myself as well. And I'm a massive advocate of self-pleasure practice. It's not easy for someone, for all people to, to come towards, but um, I think self-pleasure is something that's been so shamed in our culture. And I think very much for women in particular, um, our sexuality is something that has often been, that we're socialized for it to be for the other. Um, and that self-pleasure actually is one way of really reclaiming our sexuality for ourselves to find out what does it feel like when my libido lifts? What does it feel like when this energy starts to move around my body? Mm. How how do I experience that? How do I move? What do I sound like? How do I breathe? How does it breathe me? Mm -hmm. So I am a massive advocate for that, um, for women and for men and non-binary people, you know, however you identify, I think every being could benefit from that if they mm -hmm. feel open to it. So yeah, the list goes on. Life is full of things to make us alive, aren't we? Isn't it? We're very fortunate that way if we look for it. So, yeah. Beautiful. I just wondered whether you had any poem that you wanted to finish with or whether you feel we'll just finish there. Yeah, I could finish with a Rilke poem. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Thanks, Karen. God speaks to each of us as we are made, then walks with us silently out of the night. These are the words, 
the numinous words we hear before we begin. You, called forth by your senses, reach to the edge of your longing, become my body. Grow like a fire behind things so their shadow spreads out and covers me completely. Let everything into you, beauty and terror. Keep going. Remember, no feeling is forever. Don't lose touch with me. Nearby is the land they call life. You will recognize it by its intensity. Give me your hand. That's a Rilke poem translated by Kim Rosen and Maria Crackler. Thank you so much. Can you feel it? 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 Can you feel it?